Time to start. So good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to uh, session TH23 of the 2024 20, Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Regulatory Information Conference. And this session is entitled Optimizing Pathways for Safe Nuclear Development, Innovation, and Policy Alignment. Again, my name is David Wright and uh, one of the commissioners here at the NRC. And I'm really looking forward to today's panel. Um, you know, just for by way of background, we've been doing a series of these. This is the, the last in the series that, that connects talking about grid-related uh, issues. So, you know, before I go any further, my panel members and I would like to know a little bit about you in the audience. And uh, so we have a live polling question that we would uh, like to provide that information to us with, and which I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Producer if you'd put it up now and open for live voting. You know, for in-person participants, uh, you'll be able to text your responses with the information appearing on the PowerPoint slide. And virtual uh, participants, uh, you can access them by clicking on the polls link uh, to the right of the video window. So please take a moment and vote. And uh, to my uh, producer back there, please leave the question up and let it populate until I ask you to take it down. In the meantime, I briefly want to thank a few people. First off, I want to thank all of you in the audience and online this morning for choosing this session. Next, I'd like to thank my panel participants for taking the time uh, and giving their, their talent and expertise to help us uh, uh, do this panel today. I'd also like to thank the RIC organizers. This has been another great conference, and, and you should feel very good about the week. I'd also like to thank my staff, Team Wright, for their help and attention to detail on this panel, uh, as well as their help and support of my Tuesday morning plenary speech and where I gave my Rick remarks and, uh, and for their cameo appearance in my video. <laughs> okay, so based on the results that we see down here, um, most of your nuclear regulation, reactor people, um, and yeah, non-government has a pretty good number there. Um, so we've got a wide range of people, which is good. That's what we like. Um, and now we know who we're talking to, right? So that might help you. So thank you, Ms. Producer. You can take the first question down now. You know, as we enter the, uh, this last day of the RIC and the last sessions of the RIC, I reflect that over the past couple of days we've had uh, the opportunity to discuss many topics associated with rapid innovation in the nuclear sector. Uh, today's panel is an outgrowth of these discussions and uh, featuring examples of how industry is adapting in this landscape and key focus areas for regulators and lawmakers seeking to create policies that enable the safe adoption of new technologies. Specifically, our panelists will share industry, government, and international perspectives on emerging nuclear uh, and energy infrastructure advancements and the challenges policymakers face in supporting diverse energy generation technologies on a modern grid. We've got a great group of presenters uh, for the panel today, uh, and I believe you will learn a great deal from each of them as we address these topics. To maximize our time on this for the topic today, I'll, I'll give a brief introduction for each panelist, but I'd like to encourage you to please visit the speakers pages of the RIC program uh, and the agenda to view their full bios. They're, it's an impressive group of panelists and experts. Kicking off uh, for us today will be Shannon Rafferty uh, Sensilla. She's Vice President of Fleet Support at Constellation. Among several topics, Shannon will discuss innovation and training, remote inspection and maintenance, digital monitoring, and uh, artificial intelligence. She'll also touch on challenges such as innovation integration and knowledge and qualifications. Next will be Jennifer Schaefer, and I will refer to her as Jen, and you'll find out why in a minute. Uh, she's Associate Director of Technology at the uh, Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency in Energy, or affectionately known as ARPA-E. Um, Jen will provide an overview of several initiatives to advance the deployment uh, and development of next generation disruptive innovative technologies. We'll then hear from another Jennifer, and I will call her Jennifer, it's Jennifer Ewell. Uh, she's from the Nuclear Inter uh, 
Nuclear Energy Institute, and uh, she's Vice President of Technical and Regulatory Services, and she will present on a, uh, several industry-wide innovation efforts, uh, challenge areas, and considerations for regulator and lawmaker focus. Last, but certainly not least, uh, Deanne Cameron. And Deanne is head of the Division for Nuclear Technology Development and Economics at the Nuclear Energy Agency. Um, and she'll discuss global perspectives, including insights from the recently released second edition of the NEA Small Modular Reactor Dashboard, which they were all out by the bottom of the stairs during the week, uh, uh, going to the lower level. And if you had the opportunity to pick one up, uh, I hope you did. Um, if not, talk to her. Maybe she can get you one. Uh, after the panelists present, we're going to have time for some questions and answers. Uh, for those of you in the room, please scan the QR code displayed on the screen. The code will drop you to a page specific to the session, to this session, um, and it'll have a tab for Q&A where you can input your uh, question on your, your mobile device. For those of you joining virtually, uh, please click on the Q&A tab, and you can submit your questions through the browser. Uh, we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can uh, when we get to the Q&A portion, so please submit your questions as they come to you. Um, so before we move to our first panelist, let's bring up our second live polling question, which is, what do you think is the most challenging barrier to innovation in the nuclear sector? And Ms. Producer, please leave the slide up uh, for a moment while the results are populating. Let's see what we got going on here. Huh. So these uh, results are pretty interesting, and they're, you know, it looks like we've got cost financing and regulatory review being the top two, and tech, uh, the technology part, the readiness part, seems to be uh, garnering some interest. So I'm interested to hear uh, how this response aligns with the challenges and initiatives of Shannon and, and our other panelists will be discussing. Uh, so thank you, Ms. Producer. You can take the question down now. And with that, Shannon, the floor is yours. All right, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Commissioner Wright, for inviting me to be part of this session. And um, by honoring Women's uh, History Month by having an all-female panel, so really nicely done, Commissioner. Um, you know, as part of this session, we're going to look at the evolving energy landscape and how the industry is adapting. It, and my session today is going to intended to share some of the ways that we are integrating innovation into our everyday work at the nuclear power plants. And I have to remember to use my clicker. Okay, so why innovation? Innovation is crucial to the future of nuclear energy, and we must embrace new technologies to remain competitive, safe, and assure that we continue to play a critical role in shaping the industry's future. Also, the ability to innovate is a huge, engage efficiencies is a huge satisfier for our current workforce, and as a mom of three future engineers, I can attest that it is absolutely gonna be required for our next generation of workforce. So our ability to innovate is vital to our ability to attract and retain talent. So how are we doing this? In the area of training, um, these are just some of the, uh, I won't go through every one of them, but these are just some of the areas um, where we're using innovation and training. And the first one I'll talk about is our equipment operator on demand training program. It allows us to get operators integrated into the workforce and qualified faster than the traditional approach. And it doesn't, um, it doesn't require us waiting for 10 to 15 people to put together a formal class. So if you have a desirable candidate that you want to get moving right away, you can put them into this program and get them started quickly. The program is a combination of a two-week classroom experience, then on-shift and self-study paced training, and on average it reduces the time to fully qualify an equipment operator by about six weeks. Virtual reality technology also has been used in applications like foreign material exclusion uh, training, as well as practicing disassembly and reassembly of plant equipment. Our digital plant viewer is a computer simulation of our plants and allows you to perform virtual walkdowns of plant equi equipment that are normally not accessible without picking up dose or, or encountering potential industrial hazards. Our Learning Anytime, Anywhere program uses quick YouTube type videos in various applications, such as performing maintenance activities in areas that are often not accessible or for infrequently performed tasks. These videos are used for knowledge transfer and retention and can be linked to pre-job briefs, 
to job familiarization guides, and even to work packages. And over the past year, we've seen an increase of over 300% in the use of these videos. And finally, the glass top simulator is a portable device with a screen that can be configured like a control panel. It can be used to practice crane operation or perform main control and surveillances, such as pump valve and flow tests. And the system will respond very similar to our main control room simulator and allows operators to gain proficiency, to practice before they perform the test, and to run what-if scenarios. Remote inspections are becoming increasingly common. This technology reduces radiation exposure for workers and improves the accuracy of inspections and maintenance. We've used drone technology to proactively identify degradation in normally inaccessible areas prior to failure of the component. We've also utilized drones in high dose and high temperature areas to take pictures and be used for planned future repairs. At one of our plants, you can see some of the statistics on the screen, but it helped us save over 3,000 person hours of work, 18 person rem of dose, and mitigated industrial safety risks, and it was able to take the footage from the drone flight and integrate it into the digital plant viewer that I previously talked about. The picture on the top left of the screen is an aerial shot of a reservoir that we use for makeup water. And we had aggressive vegetation growth in this reservoir. We were able to do drone flights to monitor the growth and schedule remover, removal prior to the vegetation impacting our intake structure. And on the bottom, you can see how we utilize drones with thermal camera, camera technology to do surveys of our switch yards. So digital monitoring isn't new, but we're developing it in different ways. We're leveraging robotic technology for monitoring in hazardous and hard to reach areas. We have an extensive fleet-wide infrastructure that optimizes performance monitoring, mobile worker applications, data analysis, and maintenance to reduce costs and improve plant and analytics. This allows us to deploy thousands of devices at each station with enough capacity, like IP addresses and bandwidth, for various sensors, cameras, carts, and mobile devices and radios. This provides us the capability to utilize the right device for the application. For instance, on the top left is a mobile cart, mobile fire cart. It has been recognized that fire watches may not be the most practical or efficient way of compensating for inoperable fire protection equipment. So having a cart like this would, um, that is able to detect smoke and visually identify a fire in an area can reduce the personal burden of performing the fire watch duties. On the top right is one of the robots that we have that can be deployed for inspection and monitoring in hard to reach locations, high radiation locations, and locations that would require loss of generation if a person had to perform the inspection. They can also reduce costs and increase efficiency by performing inspections, eliminating the need for building scaffold or any other temporary structures. And finally, at the bottom, you can see some of our, our data tools. Um, we leverage analytical data um, in real time to forecast potential issues or failures, allowing for a condition-based maintenance program versus a periodic planned work. This can improve equipment reliability, decrease costs by eliminating unneeded maintenance tasks. Also, by addressing maintenance needs before failure occurs, it minimizes system unavailability. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about artificial intelligence as part of my innovation discussion. So yesterday at the uh, AI session, there was a poll, and about 20% of the participants said that they were already using AI. They also demonstrated success in controlling actual plant conditions, so it's very clear that AI has the potential to optimize nuclear power operations and improve safety. So in this slide, I'm just gonna highlight a few ways of how we use AI in different functional areas. And for example, in operations, Microsoft Copilot can be used to gather field information across multiple systems to improve efficiency and operate around. In maintenance, um, we're utilizing or working to utilize AI to automate our work planning process. And in engineering, AI-driven researches can be utilized to support troubleshooting activities. And from a corporate oversight perspective, data, data, performance data from multiple sites can be compiled over a comprehensive, uh, over your comprehensive fleet so that you have a view of all of the data from across your fleet and you can understand what your fleet performance looks like. 
So what does all of this look like in the day-to-day -day life of a plant person? And how does it improve job satisfaction and proficiency? So let's walk through some examples. So this is like a day in the life of a plant individual. I, I picked a, a supervisor. And so it's early morning, the supervisor walks, walks into work, or even before that, maybe they're checking it on their phone. They can utilize uh, AI to give them an overview of their daily meeting schedule and any deliverables that they have for the day. Then they can utilize the Copilot application to summarize the morning plant status meeting and any actions that pertain to their department. So during their kickoff, they can set the priorities for their team for that day. At some point during the day, they might receive a predictive alert that indicates a potential equipment issue. And AI at that moment provides them the previous trends for that piece of equipment, previous work order history, and issue reports, and shares the most likely failure mechanism. AI then can be utilized to assist the planning and work order generation for the repair. So as you can see, the use of AI can streamline administrative work, help leaders set priorities for the day, and quickly identify and resolve equipment issues. Finally, I want to touch on large-scale digital modernization. This is a project that we are pursuing in partnership with the Department of Energy and Idaho National Labs. It will upgrade safety system logic from analog technology to a digital platform and modernize the main control and interface features. This will result in improved reliability, optimize human interface features, and reduce plant instrumentation, labor, and maintenance co or material costs. Once this is completed, it will eliminate 1,800 safety-related components, 58 preventative maintenance and corrective maintenance annually, 796 surveillance tests annually, and over 1,400 round points annually. It also reduces human error opportunities by eliminating things like channel operability tests, um, installation of box installation tests for testing, and tag out removals and applications. Operator interfaces, interfaces and maintenance diagnostics are also going to be improved. The system will be able to continuously self-test and diagnose all trains of safety functions. It will improve the ability and spectrum of the quality of the main control and information, and it will reduce operator burden through automation. This project also demonstrates the light water safety system digital upgrades on a large scale and it benefits from recently improved industry processes, such as the NRC Alternative Review Process, ISG06, and the Standardized Digital Upgrade License Application Request Framework. But of course, we talked about it in the poll, and I saw some of your answers. There's definitely challenges to implementing innovation. Innovation does not happen without all of these challenges. And I would say some of the top ones that I've listed on my slide here are cyber and physical security limitations, as well as regulations need to be considered, as well as the integration and impact to existing design plan. Some of these ideas also require large upfront investments before you can even get your first use case on the ground, which makes it difficult sometimes to demonstrate the cost benefit of what you're trying to achieve. And finally, the knowledge and qualification requirements of the end users should always be considered. And our quest to leverage innovation to support the evolving energy landscape, we need to ensure that the user's experience is a positive one and that we are thoughtful about our change management plans. Overall, or otherwise, all the time and effort and costs will be wasted if the technology is never used. And to that point, I'd like to end with a quote by Warren Bennis. Innovation, by definition, will not be accepted at first. It takes repeated attempts, endless demonstration, monotonous rehearsals before innovation can be accepted and internalized by an organization. And this requires courageous patience. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, I've been a fan of uh, what Constellation's been doing since I came to the commission, especially in the field of, in the area of innovation. Um, you, your, your company's been leaning in, leaning forward in this and thinking outside the box. And you know, you're one of the leaders in this space, and, uh, and it's obvious why. You know, I've actually walked that robot dog spot. Um, it's kind of like a video game. And 
it's so easy to operate, I believe, that my grandchildren could probably make it do tricks. I, I'm pretty sure they can make it roll over or do something. Um, so it, it, it's quite it's quite amazing, and, and the the uses for that you haven't even scratched the surface on what you can do with it. I, I know that our neighbors to the north are active in innovation space as well, and um, I'm, it'll be interesting. I'm a little interested in, to learn about how um, is if they're and how is the, the, the community of learning taking place? How is that happening, and and how is it being shared? Um, and uh, you know, how, how is that being communicated around the world? So I'd be interested you know, maybe to get to later. Um, yeah, before we move on to our next panelist, let's bring up our third live polling question. And it is, what do you see as the most important area for innovation in the nuclear sector? So, um, so we'll give the, it's populating now, that's pretty good. Y'all are ahead of the game, that's really nice. Um, so it looks like advanced fuels, advanced materials, that's big. All right. Um, so I'm going to be curious while it's populating here to, to hear what maybe you think um, about this question uh, as you have time or maybe in the Q&A. So it looks like a majority of our audience think that the most important thing is AI and digital twins with, you know, advanced materials and advanced fuels not, not far behind. So that's interesting. Um, I'd like to hear y'all's thoughts on this too if you have a moment to address that later. Um, so thank you, Ms. Producer, you can take that down. Um, and our next presenter is Jen Schaefer. And let's jump right in with your presentation to learn how OPERI's uh, efforts are helping address some of these things. Perfect. All right, let's go over here. And it's here, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? So, okay. Um, yeah, so. As Commissioner Wright said, I'm uh, RPE Associate Director of Technology, Jennifer Schaefer, and I'm going to be talking about innovation in nuclear. And I'll provide a little bit of perspective as far as how we think about things at RPE and what the opportunities that exist there. And I don't believe, actually, I have. Well, I, I do have a disclaimer slide. This is new from legal to make sure that it's clear that these are my opinions, not necessarily broadly representing the agency. But... Um, I want to take a moment to talk about RPE and the broader vision team. So there's myself, there's Program Director Bob Ledoux, there's Program Director Bill Horak, and people may not know this about RPE's structure, but it turns out that when you come to the agency as a Program Director, you actually are in a term-limited position. And so we have three Program Directors right now, but over time people will roll off, people will come back on, and it's actually critical to the innovation ecosystem within RPE that you're willing to have people come in where maybe the previous program director didn't like that concept. And so it always ended up shelved. And so then somebody else comes in and it says, no, 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 I want to look back at that again, right? And so as we're thinking about structurally how innovation occurs and things of that nature, I just want to take a moment to point this out because actually apropos of the polling question that was up there, right, when it comes to thinking about things like advanced fuels, like AI, these are things that could very easily end up within an RPE portfolio for us to consider if a program director comes along and says, hey, this is also really important to me. So that's how we fit into this equation a little bit. So when we look at the advanced nuclear fission portfolio at the agency, it really started about in 2017. And some of you may have known Rachel Slabaugh, who was a former RPE program director. And what happened when she looked at the landscape is she said, hey, it seems that actually there's really some things that we haven't been thinking about as much when it comes to cost in the nuclear industry and how we can actually be innovating with cost in mind and enabling deployment. And it was with this that she said, let's start the Meitner program. And this is how can we greatly reduce advanced reactor capex. And underpinning this was actually a lot of digital technologies for how we can do digital engineering with respect to dropping reactor costs of construction, with respect to how we can start thinking about uh, what academically the idea of reactor-based control and AI tools, and that was all underneath the Meitner program. The next program that she came up with is she said, okay, let's live in a world where, where Meitner has worked. 
And now we can decrease the costs of advanced reactor construction, which we know we still have a long way to go, but we're RPE, we're supposed to be skating to the punk. And she said, now let's look at operation and maintenance costs. And this was another place where there was significant innovation with respect to using digital tools and AI as far as how we could think about reactor security, reactor maintenance, all these sorts of pieces of this. Surprisingly, when, th when piece of operation and maintenance costs can be advanced reactor uptime. And this is something that we haven't looked at quite as closely in the agency. It didn't end up being underneath the Gemini portfolio, but this is something that we'll be thinking about more and more in the future. And it was actually at this point that I came over as program director and inherited the Gemini program. And this is what we've been working with over the course of the past few years. And actually, funny enough, one of the things that I'm doing after this today is I'm going to see the X Energy control room ribbon cutting ceremony because ARPA-E was integral in basically funding that early work to help get that developed. So it was really nice, actually, as Shannon was talking about control rooms and things of this nature. From what I see when I look across the advanced reactor landscape, everybody is developing a digital control room. And it makes sense, right? Nobody's going to be putting an analog control room in an advanced reactor. And this is where we have to start thinking about this. There are other places where innovation hits within nuclear, right? And of course, one of the places where you could consider this is in the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle, which is actually where my expertise resides. And so we actually had two programs in this space. One of them was program director Bob Ledoux, and this is the Onwards program. And one of the pro programs or problems that Bob saw coming down the pike is we have all of these advanced reactors. All of them have their own independent fuel forms. And as a consequence of this, many of them have their own different waste forms. And it's not clear what the path to disposal looks like for many of these advanced reactors. If you have a, a metallic fuel, what is the disposal pathway for this? If you have a fuel and molten salt reactor, what is the disposal pathway for this? And Bob said, you know, it's great that the advanced reactors are moving forward, but we could start funding some R&D to start looking at waste forms, to start looking at disposal, to start looking at, frankly, canister design for how we might think about this. And this is basically what the Onwards program took on. My bread and butter and background is in nuclear fuel recycling. And this was, OK, part of this is how can we start thinking about innovation in uh, management of nuclear fuel recycling? And this was the Curie program. And one of the things that I saw as I had looked through the past is that classically, when we talked about recycling as a community, really this was basically the classic nuclear fuel recycling technology. This was Purex, this was solvent extraction, this was generating pure plutonium streams. And while that was something that we needed uh, at a time when we were developing it, right, during the Manhattan Project, right, this is where all this technology came from. If you actually started from a clean slate for what we needed today for nuclear fuel recycling, it actually wasn't what we developed back, you know, about 70 years ago. It, was, it would be considering things like how do we co-recover plutonium with actinides, right? Because we don't need a pure plutonium stream. Is there a moment to think about what costs are for recycling facilities? Because at the time, we didn't consider this really seriously for the Manhattan Project, right? Today, if we want to think about recycling costs, it would make sense if we could be much more attentive to how we could structurally decrease costs while being safe, obviously, across these types of facilities. And that was really what Curie sought to innovate in. And then, of course, we've been thinking about other things like transmutation of nuclear fuel, as well as what perhaps you could use heat for industrial applications of nuclear. So this is everything that we have basically going on with the nuclear portfolio at RPE. And keep an eye on this, because things may be coming down the pike further. One other piece that I'll say, when I think about innovation, because this is kind of the core of the panel today, right? What, what are, is innovation in nuclear? How do we enable it? I think of it in kind of two threads. One is the innovation side of the house. How do we develop the technologies? How do we get this R&D funded? How do we do all of these pieces? Then there's the implementation side of the house, right? Now there is a feedback loop between these two, but there are things that you can be doing in innovation that are independent of implementation, and then there are things that you need to be thinking about when you are innovating to make sure that they are actually going to be attentive to implementation. And that's one thing that we have in RPE is both basically 
an R&D focus as the program director, as well as a commercialization focus in our tech-to-market team. So those will be some things uh, in the lens of what I'll be talking about here. So let's talk a little bit more about reactors. So many of us are familiar with the idea of a micro reactor, a small modular reactor, of course the classical large scale reactor. And here's basically a timeline of how some of these things are moving forward. This is not a completely inclusive timeline, but right, we know Kairos and Oklo are thinking about 2026. We know Westinghouse, Hitachi thinking about 2028. TerraPower and X-Energy around the 2030 timeframe. And there are of course others on the landscape here, right, that are being considered. And so as a consequence of this, we need to be thinking about what innovation is relevant to us. And so these include things like digitization, which is something that has come up a couple of different times in the poll that I'll speak more of about recycling of spent fuel and then also, of course, advanced reactor fuel cycles. The other piece within this that is really important to consider as you're operating in an innovation ecosystem is there can be a lot of emerging market dynamics that don't touch explicitly on your ability to innovate, but basically that are kind of the, the market pull is how we talk about them at RPE. One of the biggest ones that we're seeing right now uh, is actually the policy framework, right? So at RPE, we try, we basically, do things saying that we don't touch policy. We're innovators, if policy happens, we need to be attentive to it and thinking about how it'll impact commercialization, but we obviously have to be aware of it. And we're seeing a couple of different threads of this come through, right? We're seeing significant congressional uh, action with respect to funding of advanced reactor R&D, funding and de-risking advanced reactors, as well as on a more international stage, of course, we saw COP28 with the tripling of nuclear power by 2050, right? All of these things send strong market signals to investors that say, hey, we can start investing in nuclear more and more, and hey, we can also maybe start thinking about investing in early stage nuclear and early stage R&D more and more. So these are, this is how policy can actually impact the R&D sector and what's happening there. Another emerging dynamic that's really critical is artificial intelligence. We're seeing this right now, the implementation of large language models, as Shannon was showing, the ability for basically machine learning and AI to do things like sensor fusion, so you're able to pull from multiple parts of a plant such that you can make more informed decisions, right? This is something that can be very difficult for a human operator to do. And so these are the sorts of things that we're realizing. What this means for us as, as a hub for innovation is how do we actually harness this so it deploys most rapidly? One of the things, I've learned a couple of different things from the Gemina program as we were running it. One of them is that standards are absolutely critical. It was something that when we brought up the, the program immediately, there are, th there are things at RPE that we say when we're developing a program. One is, here are the known knowns. Here are the things that I'm not even going to bother figuring out that's beyond the scope of the program. And here are the things that we're going to figure out along the way. One of the things that we figured out along the way is that standards are really critical if we're going to implement artificial intelligence and digital technologies. And so this is something that I've been, in any program development scope where people are thinking about this, I'm like, how are you building your standards community? What are you doing to actually help impact this on a commercialization standpoint? So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is actually we need to get this physical connection to the digital technology such that when you actually go talk to a regulator, you aren't talking about just an abstract entity. You're able to talk about things in very concrete manner and that way you're, they're not having to imagineer what is actually the safety basis or considerations with respect to this. One of the aspects of this that's really exciting with respect to Constellation, this is probably one of our first implementations where we have a technology within Gemina, but we're actually implementing it at a Constellation plant. It's in passive mode, so it's not doing you know, anything actively, but we're able to start getting the data, we're able to start getting what we need to actually start moving forward with this, and this is a project actually, I'm on a quarterly review for this this afternoon. And then the other piece of this is industrials and how this impacts things. So one of the things that we've seen when it comes to market and market pull is that the utilities can be a very important partner, but it turns out that things like data centers and industrial partners like oil and gas can actually, they're willing to accept a certain level of market risk that utilities may not actually be in a position to take on. And as a consequence of this, this also can pull certain technologies across the finish line. And so these are things that actually directly intersect with the innovation ecosystem. So I basically have two more slides. 
One of the slides that I'll talk about here is microreactors. And so this is a space where I believe actually it was about 2016, we were thinking about uh, what we were going to do in the RPE portfolio as far as types of technologies. And microreactors were one of the things that came to the fore. And we funded uh, Westinghouse's Evinci reactor. And now we've seen many, many more come into the, the ballast for this. There was a lot, you can imagine, for those of you in the community, right, it was not quite clear what the value proposition of microreactors was sometimes. You know, maybe you could think of it as a one-for-one -one replacement for diesel generators, but, you know, what would be the value for that? Would we need to develop an entire supply chain, right? All of these things were risk factors. What we're seeing more and more emerge as we look more closely at microreactors, and you're seeing, frankly, more microreactor technologies come to, fo come to the fore, is that there is a real opportunity here because it seems like when you get to the microreactor size, all of a sudden you're not at that large scale construction size, you're in where you can actually manufacture something. And here's where you can really start he hitting your economies of, uh, I don't want to say size, but economies of scale. Basically, you can actually start manufacturing it and learning rapidly. And so there's other knock-on benefits that we didn't anticipate this. What this means for innovation, though, is if we staff a microreactor the same way that we've classically staffed some other things and are maybe not leveraging AI and digital technologies the way that we can, the cost proposition and the value proposition is not going to be what it could be. And so this is a real place where innovation could actually be critically enabling and disrupt what we thought was going to be the case for microreactors. The last bit that I'll say is digital twins and control, and this is actually, I completely stole this figure from the NRC, and I've been inter engaging significantly with Raj Iyengar and others on this, because it's actually just a great figure, um, and they've been great partners with this. But this connects some to the microreactor conversation, that if you're going to deploy many of multiples of microreactors, if you're able to do things like start to have the conversation about more displaced control of them, and obviously this is something that needs to be worked out, right? the economics of them start to make more and more sense. The other place where you can get with digital twins and control is operations and maintenance, right? You can start getting in a predictive re maintenance regime. All these things have significant cost benefit. And we need to get down this cost curve rapidly as we're deploying these new reactor technologies. So, uh, some of my concluding thoughts here. The other thing that I didn't hit through this is when it comes to digital technology, sometimes it feels like we just are gonna flip the switch on this and they're all of a sudden gonna be a part of our ecosystem. The reality of how I see this rolling out is it's gonna be gradual and it's gonna be kind of piece by piece and we're gonna see aspects of it be taken on and eventually we're gonna get more and more comfortable with technology on all fronts and this is how we'll build this and this is part of what we're building right now. You know, when it comes to smaller reactor designs, we do recognize that they create an opportunity for decreased hazard, right? The hazard basis for a micro reactor is not the same as it is for a bigger reactor and as a consequence of that, the regulatory interface, while obviously you want to have something very safe, perhaps doesn't doesn't look quite the same because intrinsically it is a safer design, right? And so we're going to have to have this balance of how we think about what our safety needs for, are for these types of technologies as we consider di digital implementation. And then also we need to be dedicating resources significantly for increasing familiarity with digital technologies basically across the board. And I believe that that was my last slide. So if it works, will it matter? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. I mean, R RPE's got a lot going on. You know? um, and I was, I was fortunate enough you invited me over to uh, meet with your team a, a while back and um, to experience and, and learn what you had going on. Um, and I really appreciate the partnership and the relationship that's been established between your agency and your area and the NRC because it's really important for us to understand what's coming and how we need to be prepared to move forward because we've got to think differently mm -hmm. you know, about a lot of that. So we really thank you for that. Um, so let, before we go to the next panelist, let's bring up our uh, next uh, and final polling question, uh, which is, do you think current national policy supports innovation in the nuclear sector? Um, and it looks like it's populating and um, we'll see what, what happens here. So I'd like to remind you uh, to use the app to begin asking your questions of the panelists uh, that we'll get to in, in just a little bit. So remember the code will drop you to a page specific to this session and you'll have a tab for the Q&A where you can input your question on your mobile device. And again, for those virtually, click the Q&A tab and you can submit your question through the browser. So it looks like 
Boy, we're almost split down the middle. Huh. What else is new? Um, <laughs> yeah. So th thank you, Ms. Producer. You, uh, you may pull the live polling question down. So next up is uh, Jennifer Yule from NEI. And I'm excited to hear your perspectives inform, uh, informed by the industry at large. Um, and you've been a friend a long time. And welcome. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner Wright, and for everybody who organized this session for inviting me to speak today. Uh, so I am actually going to rearrange because I can't see over the podium. Um, <laughs> all right. So I just want to start my presentation with another uh, question for you all. I'm using low tech here because I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand or not. Okay. How many of you think that uh, nuclear power is critical to the nation's energy future? All right, great. So hopefully, I'm looking at Jim Slider, who works for me at the NEI. And Jim, I did not see you participate. Is there a reason for that? <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's a given. Thank you, Jim. Uh, anyway, Jim helped me with these slides, so I want to uh, uh, acknowledge his effort here. Um, so my talk is going to be a little different. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is, one, the nation's need for nuclear energy, uh, that innovation is in fact an imperative, uh, how the NRC can enable innovation, and a little bit of a pivot, does the drive for transparency inhibit innovation? And that is NRC's drive for having a lot of guidance so that uh, applicants understand what they're looking for. Does it inhibit innovation? And then can we find the right balance? So first up, for those of you who may not think that nuclear is uh, critical to the nation's energy future, let me just say last year, 2023, 18% of the nation's power was nuclear. Uh, we look at it from a carbon-free perspective, and we are almost getting to half. All right, nuclear is the backbone of our stable electricity grid. As we get more and more renewables onto the grid, we need more and more baseload power, but we need carbon-free baseload power. And nuclear is doing a great job. In fact, we have the highest capacity factor of any other form of electricity production. We're uh, at 93% in 2023. And over the last 20 years, we've been over 90% on average. The nearest uh, electricity generation source that is anywhere close is geothermal at 69% and natural gas at 66%. So absolutely, nuclear is the backbone of our stable electric grid. Now, do we need nuclear? Well, let me just say, the recognition that nuclear power is critical to the world's energy future. Um, we have a number of data points. I selected a few. First, it's, it's a global need. At the COP28, uh, there was a pledge by numerous countries to triple nuclear power by, by 2050. Uh, DOE did its own analysis of how much nuclear power is needed uh, by 2050, and they see the U.S. tripling nuclear by 2050. And subsequent license renewal is a necessary part of our energy future. So we look at the need for nuclear. It is recognized uh, in the, by the nation. It's probably the only position that has bipartisan support um, in our Congress at this point. Um, and guess what? The road to getting to that future runs right through the NRC. So. Uh, we also need to enhance our role in the global market. We are being outcompeted by other nations in our export, and that has energy security implications. It also has national security implications, and our influence uh, overseas depends on establishing these 100-year-plus relationships with other countries. 
We're also seeing new organizations asking for carbon-free power and reliable carbon-free power. We have tech companies, oil and gas companies, chemical companies. Everybody is interested in carbon-free nuclear power because it is the most reliable form of power. And when we look at what the utilities are projecting, we're seeing more and more utilities in their integrated resource plans, which is our, their plans for the future, including nuclear power. So in, to enable this, we absolutely positively must maintain high standards. That's not, not uh, debated. That is an absolute fact, and we will do so. So look at our federal support. Uh, last question asked about uh, federal support for innovation. Uh, the federal government has invested over $10 billion into nuclear power. And as those production tax credit and in investment tax credits accrue over time, it's going to be much more than $10 billion. So yes, innovation is part of this mix. We asked our members, what does your future look like? And we got the response. Uh, license renewal, 90% over the 90% of the fleet's going to subsequent license renewal. There are some plants that don't have license renewal yet, but they have uh, submitted to the NRC. And we're seeing the ramp up of those subsequent license renewal applications. And you've heard this throughout uh, the conference, so I don't want to belabor the point. Um, we're also expecting over 20 power up rates by 2030. Why? Because we need more carbon-free, reliable power. Uh, we're looking to, to extend fuel cycle for, at the plants. That involves uh, higher enriched fuel, that involves accident tolerant fuel, advanced fuel types. And there's over, or over $6 billion of investment waiting to happen in the nuclear industry. And some has already started happening. We're seeing other uses uh, beyond electricity, and you see them listed there. And when we asked our, our members how many uh, utilities are interested in building new nuclear, you can see the results for yourself. Nuclear power is critical to the nation's energy future and to the global energy future. So. Just to give you a snapshot, at this time, you've got a list of advanced nuclear deployment plans. If I had another slide to put on top of it, it would be pretty much all of the existing nuclear power plants going into subsequent license renewal. So is innovation necessary to meet this skyrocketing demand? So how many think it is? All right, some of you are very stubborn, and you're going to stick with 50-50 here. I was trying to, you know, break the tie, but anyway, I'll continue. So at this stage, with all of the advanced reactor vendors in the United States, let alone globally, there's a wide range of uh, advanced reactor options. There's different sizes. There's, uh, you know, different... Thermo, uh, thermohydraulic uh, um, fluids. There's, you know, different outlet temperatures. There's, you know, all sorts of designs out there. So we can go from a micro reactor, support a micro grid, uh, to you know the very large plants that are passive, uh, that are passive safety plants that are already are licensed. So you know we've got a number of options. Um, innovation is necessary to, to provide that wide array of options. Innovation is necessary to enhance safety. Uh, Shannon did a great job going over all of the different innovation activities uh, at one utility uh, across the industry. Uh, Jim Slider runs an innovation task force, and we do every year a top innovative practice award at, the, at NEI, and the innovations are, are phenomenal, really creative thinking. And right now, for the most part, those innovations don't require NRC approval. So, 
but we are getting into the need for NRC approval. And so I want to take that on in my next slide. We also uh, want to enhance our efficiency. Uh, we want to be, absolutely want to be safe, but we also want to keep our prices as low as they can be for the customers. But safety is the primary concern. Uh, we want to ad address obsolescence. Digital instrumentation and control uh, is an example of that. We have others. Um, we also want to attract the new gen or the younger generation of engineers. We want to train them quickly, uh, but sufficiently. We want to qualify them at a faster pace because they don't see a future of 30 years working for the same company. So we need them attracted. We need to train them with you know, high quality uh, qualification requirements. And we need to retain them. And they don't want to go into a control room and see 1960s technology. Uh, so this is important to attracting that workforce that is so necessary for this expansion of nuclear power. And we also, as I mentioned before, want to compete internationally, which then supports our own national security. There are other reasons for innovation, but I thought this was a, a pretty uh, good list to start from. So how do we enable innovation? Well, our regulator needs to be flexible. And let me just take a step back. I was at the NRC for over 20 years. I've done the reviewer job. It is a hard job. For one thing, the industry needs a strong independent regulator. Absolutely. That is critical for social license so that the public can say, you know what, I think these plants are safe and I have confidence that they will remain safe. So that's necessary. So we want a strong independent regulator. And if you were to put yourself in a reviewer's shoes, for those of you who are not NR, uh, NRC employees, the reviewer has a hard job. They have an application, and they make the decision about whether a reasonable assurance of adequate protection is met. And they feel a great deal of responsibility. And so we need to recognize that. So over, the time, over time, NRC developed numerous guidance documents to help that reviewer feel like, uh, or to have more confidence that, yes, they're making the right decision. And that worked when there were, well, say, 40 years of a pretty static industry, large light water reactors. OK. Now think about it, with the pace of change that we're seeing, with this huge expansion of, of nuclear power, lots of different techniques that are available for even the simplest of activities, uh, technology is being, brought, is being brought to bear. We need to be innovative in our review approach as well. So does this drive for transparency inhibit innovation? And I think the answer is yes. It, in the past, with all of that investment in guidance, the industry knew what the NRC wanted. And so we liked that. You know, we wanted to have, you know, a very reliable result from the review process. But if you're an NRC reviewer doing that hard job, the first thing you do is you open up the standard review plan. It's about 2,000 pages. All right, how long does it take you to read those portions of the plan that apply to you? Oh, geez, but then there's 400, over 400 regulatory guides. All right, how, many, how much effort does it take to go through those guides? Just to look at subsequent license renewal, uh, we've already done license renewal. There's only a subset of aging management programs that need to change. And, oh, geez, the most recent version of the Generic Aging Lessons Learned documents over uh, 1,300 pages. There's over 400 new regs. There are numerous office instructions. There are branch technical positions. So is that reviewer really taking a look at that submittal and asking himself or herself whether or not reasonable assurance of adequate protection is provided using their own engineering judgment? Well, I think that reviewer feels pretty locked in to only accepting if it's meeting this voluminous amount of guidance documents. And so at one point, this approach did work. 
But now with the pace of change and the need for a lot of licensing for these, uh, you know, for the expansion of nuclear power, uh, we need to be faster. We can't have this voluminous amount of guidance for every single different design, every single different technology to be submitted. So my premise is for the future, the NRC needs to train its reviewers to make sound engineering decisions based on their own technical understanding, their assessment of defense in depth, their assessment of the, of the risk as one factor in the decision, uh, the assessment of whether safety margins are maintained. And I also think that holistic reviews will be more helpful so that it's not one reviewer looking at like a nanometer of, of, the, of the depth of the submittal. It's a lot of people, different technical backgrounds saying, you know what, because of this system over here, you know, that system over there that you're reviewing, um, it's not as important maybe as you think it is. So can that help us? And NRC has already started doing that. But we have to get back to what is necessary for reasonable assurance and try to break away from this rigid adherence to all of this guidance. Now, it's going to introduce differences across the reviewers. And then that's leadership's job. That is absolutely positively the leadership's job. That's the branch chief knowing what reviewers are doing what. If there are differences in opinion, it goes to the division director. That division director needs to understand what, uh, I should say, his or her, her uh, staff is doing um, and needs to be the arbitrator making the decision. And it needs to be timely because we have so much to do. And the nation and the globe is depending on the NRC to get this right, as well as the industry's got to submit really strong uh, uh, justification for whatever it's asking for. So this is a shared responsibility here. So bottom line here is I think we've got to change the way reviews are being done. Can, can we do this? Is this something that NRC maintains its independence, uh, but co you know, collaborates with the industry and the members of the public so we can maybe start thinking a little bit different? Going back to basic engineering principles, I think the regulations must be flexible. However, they need to be repeatable. And that's where leadership comes into play. So key takeaways, um, just from my perspective, these are, again, my thoughts. Uh, nuclear's role in decarbonization is accepted as absolutely essential. Uh, new plants and subsequent license renewal playing key roles in the nation's energy mix and, and, the, and the world's energy mix. Innovation is imperative to meet the moment. And NRC's got to embrace efficient decision making with little guidance go back to engineering judgment and engineering principles, but have leadership there, knowledgeable leadership there to make sure that the reviews are being done consistently by other reviewers. And NRC's got to re ensure repeatability through that oversight by leadership. Where to start? Well, first of all, performance-based regulation, I think is a great concept. Uh, and, and in fact, NRC strives to do performance-based uh, approaches in, in rulemaking, but we can't do rulemaking on every regulation out there. Uh, so we also need to consider holistic reviews. So every reviewer understands the importance of their section in the overall scheme of ensuring uh, safety. So with that, I will uh, stop here. And again, thank you for your attention and, and the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And I know from personal experience that the regulatory and legal side of things can get complex and can be frustratingly slow. Um, so I appreciate your approach and also appreciate your constant um, and frequent communication on these things with the NRC. Um, so our first three panelists have addressed several key examples, challenges, and initiatives from a U.S. perspective. But now I'm interested to hear more from you, uh, Deanne, on, on the global new technology deployments insight, including uh, enabling conditions. So Deanne, the floor is yours. 
thank you, Commissioner Wright, and thank you to everybody for being here today. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. Oh, it is hard to see the slides from behind this post, isn't it? That's a you little have to tricky. go on your tiptoes. I'm not. Even, that's a little tricky. Okay, so uh, this is a graph from the 2022 NEA publication on climate change targets and the role of nuclear energy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a step back to the global perspective. Um, we had a lot of great discussions already from uh, previous panelists on very specific aspects of innovation, technical, and also domestic. Now let's take a step back and look at the global picture. Um, in this publication in 2022, the NEA called uh, for a tripling of global installed nuclear capacity, and we modeled how that could be achieved through a combination of long-term operation, large-scale new builds, and small modular reactors for a combination of electricity production, but also heat applications. Um, the key takeaway from this graph uh, is that based on existing policies as they stood in 2022, global installed nuclear capacity was actually on a trajectory to decrease between 2020 and 2050. Um, but uh, we found in our modeling and scenarios that a tripling is technically possible, but it would require a change to policies. Now this was published in 2022. Next slide, please. In 2023, uh, we saw a great deal of momentum around the world uh, for the role of nuclear energy to grow and expand uh, in energy trajectories and energy planning. Uh, this is a photo from the NEA ministerial level conference on roadmaps to new nuclear that we held in September of 2023 in Paris, where ministers from 21 countries and about 40 CEOs met together uh, to discuss uh, their commitments to build significant new nuclear energy in their own domestic energy systems and to identify their shared challenges. What are the biggest risks in the areas um, of finance, supply chain, workforce development, and fuel availability? They committed to continue working together to address these issues. Um, the next meeting of this group will take place in September of 2024. Uh, we'll be reporting back to ministers on progress, and there will have been significant progress in the 12 months between the two consecutive conferences. Um, but, but the priorities that they identified for us, just again, finance, supply chain, workforce, and fuel. So we can compare that to one of the poll questions um, that was asked, the live poll questions earlier. Um, next slide, please. Momentum continued to build at the end of 2023. Um, COP28. Uh, it was a significant milestone for nuclear in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of the, the significant announcements, of course, was the, the, the declaration signed by leaders from 25 countries that committed to triple global installed nuclear ca capacity by 2050. And we were delighted that they referenced NEA's analysis in support of this declaration. This is tremendous policy. Uh, support. It represents a lot of momentum, um, but success is not a foregone conclusion in reaching this tar target. So uh, let's turn to the next slide, please. And now I'm going to focus a little bit more just on the SMR piece of this, but understanding that SMR is just one of the four pillars alongside large-scale nuclear, long-term operations, and applications for heat. We see a variety of reactor concepts under development um, uh, around the world for a variety of applications and markets. And this is both a good thing uh, because it creates opportunities to decarbonize even the toughest to abate sectors of the economy, industrial applications, even transportation sectors. But it's also uh, a considerable challenge. To achieve uh, a tripling of the nuclear sector uh, will require a number of enabling conditions to be very robust. Um, that includes the policy frameworks, regulatory pathways, fuel cycle, front end and back end readiness, supply chain, robust talent pipeline, um, which I'm going to debate a little with you all in your live poll. You ranked that as one of the lowest priorities. Um, we see it potentially as one of the highest risks and highest uh, rate limiting factors for, uh, for progress in nuclear new build. Uh, another enabling condition, obviously, is public trust and uh, financing. Next slide, please. 
In 2023, NEA defined six new indicators to assess progress of SMRs around the world. Essentially, we took on the mission of trying to, uh, uh, well, review the status of SMR development and deployment around the world to contribute to an evidence-based situational awareness. Um, there's a lot of media announcements, how do we cut through the noise and understand what is really happening, uh, not only here in North America, but around the world. Um, we understood that for a complete picture, we need to look beyond technical feasibility. We need to understand progress of SMRs in licensing, siting, financing, supply chain, fuel supply, and public engagement. Next slide. In early 2024, we completed our review of every SMR on the planet. I'm very proud. I don't know if Lucas, if you're in the room, if you are, he's not in the room. Oh, he's right there. Stand up, please, Lucas. Lucas Meal was the project manager for this. Um, I think it's about 4,000 person hours of work that he oversaw uh, for this publication, so, so hats off to Lucas. Um, we identified 98 design concepts around the world. Again, that is both an asset and a challenge. One third of them, however, are just paper reactors at this time. They either have, they have no human or financial resources assigned to them. In some cases, they never made it off of uh, the paper into reality. In other cases, people started to work on it and the project ran into problems, uh, is now unfunded and is, is paused or canceled. But it means that about two thirds of the projects are in fact under development, or concepts are under development. Next slide, please. These are the SMRs uh, that are in the publication that we just launched a couple weeks ago uh, in March 2024. Uh, next slide. And they represent a variety of concepts. Some of them are water-cooled, so they're an evolution of current technologies deployed around the world. But in fact, most of them are not water-cooled. Uh, there are many Gen 4 reactor concepts here. Um, so this is quite, a, quite, quite an interesting evolution um, in the makeup of, or potentially, the makeup of the future global fleet. Next slide, please. Also, uh, they propose to use a variety of fuel cycles. And when we collected this information, to be honest, I was quite surprised. Um, I had not anticipated this level of diversity and different fuel cycles being proposed. Uh, of course, not all of these SMRs are going to make it to market. Uh, but those that do will require not only availability of fuel, which is a common topic of conversation right now, in particular with respect to HALU, um, but they're going to require waste management readiness. They're going to require R&D infrastructure to collect data and qualify uh, their fuels, validate their codes. And there's going to have to be infrastructure, including transportation, amongst other requirements for these novel fuel cycles. Next slide, please. Some propose to use LEU, many are proposing HALEU, um, but there are in fact also a few concepts that propose to use a fuel cycle that does not depend on enrichment at all, which we found very interesting. Next slide. So let me now share with you sort of a snapshot of, of global progress. This is what we're calling the SMR pipeline. So you can see on the left-hand side concepts that are not under active development. They are concepts. They are, they are articulated concepts. And then the pipeline, as you go across to the right, moves through different uh, stages of progress towards construction and commercial deployment. Five of them, the, on, at the right side of the graph, are already under construction or operating. Now, there's an enormous amount of data underlying this one simple bar chart. Um, and in fact, in the uh, publication, there are 53 or 52 graphs um, that sort of present the data underlying this in a lot of different ways. Um, I don't have time to share all of them with you, so you'll have to read the publication. But I have selected three uh, to share with you today. Next slide, please. Here's a snapshot of licensing progress around the world. So you can see a lot of reactor concepts engaged with the US NRC, a lot with the Canadian CNSC, and so on. But interesting to note, the darkest greens um, are where SMRs are already licensed to operate. And the lightest greens are where we see pre-licensing engagement taking place. So there's a volume of activity in, in North America, but there's also a depth of activity happening in China and Russia, for example. This is all based on uh, public verifiable information from the regulators themselves. So this is not vendor self-assessment. Next slide, please. 
the snapshot of progress on siting activities around the world. Here, the color scheme is that the lightest green dots are the ones that are already operating or they're under construction. The darkest greens, there's siting activity, but in the earlier stages. Might be feasibility studies, might be negotiations, might be a non-binding MOU. So you see a lot of siting activity in North America and in Europe, but in the earlier stages. And we clearly see Russia and China leading in the deployment of first of a kind small modular reactors, and that includes reactors on land and on water, and it includes generation four concepts. Next slide, please. Through the collection of all of this data, we started to see some interesting, or, or learn about some really interesting um, new applications. These, are, these on this graph are not conceptual. These are actual examples of projects that are moving forward with SMRs to replace coal, SMRs to replace fossil cogeneration for the production of hydrogen and synthetic fuels, small um, microreactors to replace diesel at mining sites, and SMRs to power data centers. Next slide, please. Now there's going to be an animation. I'm not expecting you to absorb all of it. Um, it's just indicative of what you'll see in the publication. But while this is playing, I'll recap some of our key findings, some of the things that we learned while, while compiling this report. Um, first of all, the variety of concepts, different sizes, different temperatures, different fuel cycles, different burn-up rates, um, different configurations for a variety of applications and markets. Um, that is an asset because decarbonizing electricity is only the first step, and frankly, it's the easiest step. And then we have to be able to reach into other parts of the economy that have very different requirements. Um, so that diversity of concepts is an asset, but is also a significant challenge, including um, from the perspective of regulators and national labs um, and other key enablers knowing where to, to, to grow their competencies and focus their efforts and resources. We see Russia and China leading on deployment at this time, but we see North America and Europe. We see a lot of activity in North America and Europe that is accelerating um, and, and moving quickly. Timelines are near term, and they are accelerating. There are many different business models represented across all these. So we see not only innovation in the technologies, but also innovation in um, the deployment models, the financing schemes, and the business models. Um, public and private financing, a lot of it has been sitting on the sidelines uh, waiting for uh, maybe the field to, to thin out a little bit. But we do see uh, some of that financing unlocking and accelerating, uh, which is absolutely critical. Fuel qualification and availability is going to be critical path, especially for those proposing to use novel fuel cycles. The readiness of regulators, the supply chain, and the workforce, we see those as potentially rate limiting factors. And lastly, um, there's a lot of reason for optimism. There is a great deal of momentum, a great deal of progress. Um, but we would say that through the collection of all this information, we noted that the almost all of the developers are laser focused on their first deployment project. And to the extent that we need to unlock economies of multiples and shift to fleet and manufacturing and modularization in order to unlock the true potential of SMRs, unlock the economies of multiples, that paradigm shift has not yet started in earnest. That doesn't mean it's, it's, it's not gonna happen, it just means that it hasn't started at this time. Um, so a lot of reason for optimism, but also a lot of challenges that we have to overcome collectively um, in order to make this happen. And as one of my other fellow panelists said, um, the planet needs it, humanity needs it. So um, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for the invitation to share this, uh, th these thoughts with you. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Deanne, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your participation this second year in a row, and you've uh, come a long way to do so. So uh, thank you. I'm also looking forward to uh, taking a, deep and di a deeper dive into the second edition of the dashboard. It, it looks like it's well put together and easy to understand and comprehend. Um, and I think, you know, with the diverse group that we have at the RIC, I think it's, a, it's important that we step back and really take a look at what's happening globally. Um, so the presentations, thank you so much for your remarks. They were very interesting, and, and I really thank you for your willingness to come and share with us uh, today and, and participate in the panel. So 
Mr. Uh, Ms. Producer, if you'd put the QR code back up, I guess it's up now, right? Okay, good. And if you want to submit your questions, if you haven't already, please do so. We're going to jump right into it. Um, CJ, I'm going to come to you first. Do you have uh, anything online or from the room? Uh, I do, Commissioner. We've got some great questions uh, already queued up. First one here is for Shannon. Shannon, we heard at the plenary that retention of new employees is challenged by the relatively slow rate of innovation in nuclear. And we talked a little bit about walking into the control room and it's like going back to 1960, right? And so um, has that been your experience in the utility environment, that you're having trouble staffing or retaining employees because of the slow rate of innovation? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think that that question is not even particular to nuclear power. I think just in the world today right now, there is that desire for innovation, for change, and, and uh, the ability to, to do that in your everyday workforce. Um, you know, as I mentioned in my results, it is going to be crucial as we have uh, the workforce is retiring um, and we have new generations that come in. Uh, we want to first attract those people. We want to show them the really neat things that I talked about that we talked about on a global scale as well and, and you know, bring those people into, into our, our, um, our plants and into our companies. And then it's really important to be able to give them the space to, to be creative, to be innovative, um, that support system and that time so that you can keep them, uh, you know, into the company and providing value. You know, what I found is, you know, one of the benefits of, um, you know, being able to work with such a large organization like Constellation is people are innovating every single day. We just have to give them the space and the resources to be able to move forward with that. And I think when you see new people coming in and they see that and you're trying to um, recruit them, that makes them interested if you can tell them that they have a space and you're supportive of that type of development and innovation. And then, you know, from a you know, job satisfaction perspective, um, like I said, everybody wants to be more efficient and they want to learn quicker with their proficiency. So being able to provide those opportunities to your current staff is super important as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to ask one from up here if it's all right. Um, Deanne, I'm going to come to you real quick. Um, you know, as countries seek to triple the global installed nuclear capacity by 2050, um, what are the pinch points that you see? And, they, and you mentioned a lot of things that had to happen, but are there, are there real concerns about certain areas and what would be the biggest risk to success? Um, is this on? Not quite yet. Do I have to hit a button or something? Just press there. There, oh, there we go. go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to focus the answer specifically on OECD countries. Um, and there's something very unique in OECD countries where, um, including the United States and Canada and, and European countries, over the last 20 years to different extents in different ways, we've all really kind of divested um, what used to be vertically integrated state-owned nuclear sectors. We've divested and privatized, um, which has many advantages to harness the competitive spirit of the, um, of the private sector, harness private sector innovation. But it, it results in, um, in, in some very specific challenges when you want to move quickly and you want to move a nation forward um, based on a shared strategic vision. And you no longer have sort of, you have all these different actors um, who have to you know, be convinced to move in the same direction with a shared vision um, and without falling under direct authority of, of, a, single, of a single decision maker. Um, so that's a very unique challenge. Um, and I think that also um, there's a unique opportunity to help with that in terms of collaboration amongst OECD countries um, to, uh, to, to renew and, and create strategic alliances to help compete uh, globally with, um, uh, with, with state-owned enterprises from other parts of the world. Um, those are really important. Um, and, and, and in support of that, because that's kind of really big policy um, thinking, in support of that, um, there needs to be a very, very deliberate investment in um, things that can be rate limiting. It takes time to bring a new workforce um, into the pipeline um, to bring people not only through the university system but to bring, bring people mid-career from other sectors. It takes time to ramp up your supply chain. Um, it's one thing to have 
uh, a great supply chain based on current trusted partners, but to triple, there's going to have to be a lot of new players coming onto the field, and we need to be thinking about how do you onboard new players into the nuclear family. Um, and, and all of that needs to be done with a shared vision um, of, of where we're trying to get to. Thank you very much. CJ, I'm going to come back to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is for Jennifer Yule. Uh, Jennifer, regulation has been presented as one of the restraints to innovation. Could you provide some specific examples within the current landscape uh, of that happening based on your experience? Digital INC. That was fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, again, the industry needs a, a strong independent regulator. Absolutely. Positively, it's necessary for social license. And so nobody's talking about the NRC not doing its job. Nope, it's critical. Uh, however, uh, I do think that over time uh, there has been a drive to get to absolute assurance uh, rather than reasonable. And uh, if you were to say what does reasonable assurance look like, the answer from the NRC will be it's whatever the commission says it looks like. And, and then, the, you know, individually it has to be what the reviewer thinks is necessary. And I understand that. that I understand that. It's, it's essentially the ultimate performance-based uh, requirement. Um, however, I do think that the example of digital INC, with all the safety benefits that it offers and, and has been articulated by uh, my fellow panelists, it, it's, it's a shame. The, the world is digital. And we are uh, we're really happy the commissions uh, last year issued the, uh, the risk-informed approach to common cause failure, which was the sticking point. Um, and we are now trying to get uh, guidance developed. Now, uh, I know I just said guidance may not be the best thing. In this case, I'm going to say guidance would, would be needed because uh, the industry and the staff have been so far apart about what provides reasonable assurance that I think this is a, a case where, where guidance uh, it would, would be helpful. Uh, again, we don't want it to be 2,000 pages long. We want it to be pretty concise. And we're working with the, with the industry and the NRC about providing, you know, a, a succinct uh, description of, of what the new policy would, would allow. Uh, but that one, um, that one is, is, is a black eye on the industry, Posit absolutely positively. Uh, we need to do better, um, and I think we we really do uh, need the industry and the reviewers and the in the commission. W we need to get away from this absolute assurance. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back over here, uh, Ms. Producer. If you could pull the live question three, the live polling question three, which was about what do you see as the most important area for innovation in the nuclear sector. And, and so I'm going to come to you, Jen Schaefer. All right? Uh, surprise. Um, so there was, you notice there's a spread of answers that, um, on that question that, uh, that you can see. Can you maybe, if you, is this in line with what you're seeing and what y'all are working on at, at RPE? Um, are there, um, maybe put a little bit more detail or? More context on what's yeah, being if, shown if, here. Yeah, if, absolutely. If and the one thing that I'll say, only just to piggyback on what Jennifer said, which she said beautifully, is it seems to me that this is probably the the choice of being the the perfect or the absolute regulator versus um, leveraging the broader safety benefits that come along with some of these technologies. Right? It seems like the most the single most existential thing that an NRC on some level needs to solve right now. And so um, that's at least where I'm sitting when I see this. Um, now to the question that was actually directly asked to me. Um, AI and digital twins, this is a critically enabling technology across the board, whether that you're thinking about control, whether you are thinking about maintenance, uh, whether you're thinking about all of these different pieces. Um, this is something that we've seen at the agency. This is something that we're keeping in the eye. As, as far as even thinking about supply chain innovation, Sometimes when I think about what we need to prop up in a very limited amount of time to meet our climate goals is we actually need to start thinking about how we can leverage this across the board in supply chain and deployment, et cetera. So I definitely echo the AI and digital twin observation. When it comes to advanced materials and manufacturing, and I'll also kind of 
put advanced fuels in there because I see them as two sides of a, of a very similar coin as far as the absolute are indeed that needs to be executed there. I would say that this, if there's a list of things that I'd like to take on at RPE as far as, one of them would be, okay, we need to start actually asking the control question and how we can actually, start. we're supposed to be RPE and not afraid of risk. That's one piece of it uh, when it comes to digital INC. The next thing is advanced fuels and advanced materials. How we get through this more rapidly, how we demonstrate this, how we assess this, how we manufacture the fuels, how we do this in a repeatable way. Sometimes when I hear people who, who do fuel work for the current fleet, you know, it's almost like witchcraft as far as the actual manufacturing of the fuel pellet and things of that nature, right? There's a lot of just inferential science, if you want to call it that, that goes into it, whereas you're not actually using some of the advanced manufacturing technologies that could exist there. And I think that we'd want to leverage for many things, especially if you're thinking about using transuranic fuels and you want to think about remote handling and being able to do that in a cost-effective and reasonable way. The non-electrical applications, this is something that I spent a decent amount of time on trying to develop a program in nuclear heat for industrial applications. I see it as a really important opportunity. One of the things that we struggled the most with program development that we're still working through is what is the actual innovation that gets us there more rapidly? Is it large-scale construction engineering digital tools? Is it how you're able to harmonize on a design more rapidly? I think that that's one of the more critical things. The other thing is we're still spanning the space for what would actually be the most impactful place to put our money down if you were to start investing in this as far as when you think about who the market players are and what their specific non-nuclear needs are, right? So there's still a little bit of community building, frankly, I think that needs to be done with respect to that. And then when you think about grid integration, I'd agree that this is something that we need to be thinking about when we think about how you interface with the grid, but um, it's probably not the sort of thing, like if I had to rack and stack um, the top list of things, it's probably the one that I'd be like, okay, I think we can figure this one out the most on the fly. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, CJ, I'm going to come back to you. Okay. Uh, this next question is from my uh, friend and former colleague, Deanne. Um, in your projection, you had a slide that showed projections for future needs for nuclear. Uh, what percentage of that was for electricity versus other applications? And I'm going to expand the question a little bit since we're talking about innovation. Could you also talk about other, and, and others could chime in too, are there some regulatory innovations that are necessary to enable the non-electrical applications of nuclear? And thinking about like emergency preparedness, security, how do we handle that? So if others want to chime in on that too, that would be great. So the graph that I showed um, had our scenarios. That graph was color-coded based on um, uh, long-term operation, large-scale nuclear new build, and SMR. We have exactly the same shape in the report, color-coded by electrical versus non-electrical applications. And I don't have the split right at my fingertips. Um, but it's in the report on uh, climate change targets. So uh, please check out, uh, check out the report if you'd like to see that. Um, it does include a significant amount of, uh, of heat applications. And I would say one of the key differences, at least as of 2022, between the NEA scenarios that, that we published versus at that time the IEA uh, net zero scenarios is that the IEA was focused, they were calling for a doubling of nuclear capacity by 2050, but they were focused mainly on electric, electricity production. And so it might end up, but this is a couple years ago already, right? So uh, one more thing to say, which is um, we are going to update our analysis uh, this year and, and publish a refresh to those scenarios because we know more today than we did three years ago, obviously. Um, what was the second question? <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about, are there regulatory innovations that are necessary to enable? I mean, we, we understand the sort of technical challenge, for example, with coupling, say, a high temperature gas reactor with the chemical plant, but are there regulatory changes or innovations that are necessary to enable that use of the technology? Yeah, I think so. And the regulatory innovations go hand in hand with um, uh, with some of the design innovations. Um, I, I think the extent to which the design can uh, reduce the scope of the industrial uh, project that falls under the purview of the nuclear safety regulator 
um, that has certain uh, advantages. So thinking about how you uh, technically couple your nuclear reactor with an industrial site while uh, meeting their requirements, which sometimes requires deep integration of the two technologies, um, but at the same time thinking about what the trade-off is, because if I can separate as much of the um, as much of the physical project as possible from, from the scope of the nuclear safety regulator, then I might be able to, to give the NRC a, a bit of a break, uh, right, with a smaller smaller body of, of uh, design that they they have to review. Um, I, I had, and, and then I think there's another piece of this, which is um, synchronicity of timelines. So for all of these different industrial applications, um, you know, people talk about regulatory certainty, great, um, and really often they're also implying or explicitly calling for faster regulatory timelines, right? Really, everybody wants their license just faster. But in actuality, faster is not necessarily what is needed. What is needed is synchronicity. So if you have a mine site and your planning horizon for a mine site is five years, uh, you need to be able to have your SMR in five years, and that means you need to get through the regulatory process in five years. You don't actually need it in two. You, you just need it in five. Seven, forget it. It's not going to, you know, seven means you're not an option for that mindset. And so really understanding the, the synchronicity and the timeline requirements of these different industrial sectors and helping that guide the prioritization um, within the regulatory process, I, I think that's something that needs to happen and be, be thought about. Thank you so much. So there were, there, as it always happens, you generate a ton of questions because the information they shared was a lot. We can't get to all the questions. We're, we're out of time um, now and uh, for the panel. So I'd like to thank each of you again for taking the time to, to be with us and share with us today. Um, Shannon and Jen, Jennifer, Deanne, thank you so much. And, and for all of you in the audience, for your participation and for the time you took to be with us here today. Thank you so much. Your, your questions added uh, a lot of value to the session and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. And I'm sure on the way out, if you have questions for them, they'll be glad to answer them. So thank you so much. Yeah, nice job, everybody. Great job. It's like girl power.